Hello, movie lovers. Welcome home. My name is Amy Hinterling, and you are listening to Watch This List Unplugged. Today's Hidden Gem series is kicking off with my dear friend, AJ, who I have been friends with for a long time, uh, who is a kind of a marathon expert, actually. <laughs> Uh, I became acquainted with AJ because he he loves to focus on an actor or director and then just watch a ton of their movies. So AJ, I don't know what you're marathoning right now, actually. Um, I but... literally just started two days ago. I'm doing Jerry Lewis and mm. Dorothy Malone. It should be fun doing them. I feel like you recently did Susan Sarandon, right? Mm -hmm. I just did Susan Sarandon and mm -hmm. uh, John Frankenheimer. So and that John was very fun. Yeah. Do you actually do complete filmographies or you only do the ones that you want? Um, it depends. For actors, no, just because there's way too much. Yeah. Uh, directors, depends on the filmography. Some of them, yes. Frankenheimer had a little too many. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of them are just especially Frankenheimer, a lot of TV movies that yes. didn't really grab me. Mm. Um, but who did I finish recently? Um, Alan Rudolph I finished. Like That's Jacques right. Rivet, mm. um, Almost finished Joseph Losey at the end of last year, but he has a couple that missed me. But yeah. Yeah, my friend uh, Zig or Christopher is like Frankenheimer obsessed and he's, yeah, there's a little nest of uh, Frankenheimer lovers on there. <laughs> Where he, they go beyond the films and they go into TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, their uh, their reviews helped a lot. I know, who is it? Nick Langdon is another yes. one who he helped me a Australian. lot. Australian, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, Frankenheimer has a lot to say. Yes, surprisingly more than I would have thought because I associate mm -hmm. him with like. Seconds and um, Manchurian Candidate, The Train, mm -hmm. Reindeer Games. Reindeer Games. That was the first one I did on my marathon. Is it really? Was yeah, because really? I, I started it the day after or two days after Christmas. So fit in perfectly. What did you think of that? I liked it. I had fun with it. It was very, uh, I don't know, of its time. It felt... Very fun, very relaxed, very like almost in its own head, trying to outthink itself with the twists and everything, which I like. Yeah. Um, definitely see how that movie cannot work for some people, but uh, I'm pretty firmly in the camp that it works for. Yeah, I think that that's either that's one of those this, that I feel like is either a five star film or like a <laughs> two or one. That's not yeah. really there's no middle ground with Reindeer Games. Yeah, and that is, I think it was his last film, or it was way mm -hmm. towards the end. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think he was trying to do like a, a weird Christmas time Ronin, after Ronin, and then just kept mm. doubling down on twists. Yeah, and Charlize Theron later said that it was the worst movie she ever made, <laughs> and her biggest regret. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. She's been in some pretty bad movies, but uh. <laughs> no uh, judgment, AJ. I, I love some true trash. You know that. So <laughs> yes. I will not judge someone for being in bad movies. Yeah. Uh, Reindeer Games uh, is a personal shout out to Christopher, I feel, at this point, because he gave it five stars and I watched <laughs> it because of that. And then I was very underwhelmed, save for um, Gary Sinise's committed performance and Ben Affleck is also equally kind of invested it, they it feels like people are really trying mm -hmm. yeah I don't know I that probably comes around just from working with such a I mean, prolific filmmaker like Frankenheimer mm -hmm. like he's been making I think his tv movies probably started at the end of the 50s mm. and I mean like seconds mentoring candidate and the train are all in the 60s and this is 40 years after making like right. multiple masterpieces. So he deserved it. Yeah. Actors right. should give him what they, uh, what they can. Yes. I was just talking about this with, uh, Rob 
about Les Samurai where De Leon was saying that he wasn't in movies later in his life because the directors <laughs> just weren't the same. It it wasn't the same as in oh, the man. old days. Yeah, Melville is a Melville. Mm-hmm. He he was before I started like listing out my marathons. He was one of the first directors I worked through when I joined Letterbox. Mm. But uh, yeah, he is as intricate as they come and as stylish as they come. I love his movies. Yeah, and John Woo was very uh, mm-hmm. influenced by him. Oh, so yeah. we were talking about a better tomorrow and hard boiled and just yeah. how. It's so fascinating to me how directors will see something and then mm-hmm. get it, and then they're they're just kind of stuck with it, like yeah. an impression that lands with them, and then they sort of weave it through their own films. But you can clearly see if you know mm-hmm. that it goes back. To- yeah, it's like the trench coat is the trench coat fits Wu as well as it does Melville at this point. Like it's yeah. the iconography of both of them just intertwined now. Even though Wu said uh, nobody would ever wear a trench coat <laughs> in Hong Kong, <laughs> he made them do it because no, he was yeah he, he was doing a nod to Melville. Yeah, those movies. Yeah, he Cho Yun Fat is the absolute coolest right. person in a trench coat ever. Yes. If you liked, I'm going to throw another one out there before we even start. A Better yeah. Tomorrow Three, not by John Wu, it's by Sui Hark. Maybe the best one. AJ, you Just are throw it out there. <laughs> <laughs> you also love sequels, right? Like you watch, yeah. you watch the two and threes of things. Yeah, I, I go into. I, I have no animosity against sequels. Like uh, Turbulence Three. Love it. I mean i I come from like the horror world, so right like, of all the big franchises, except. Nightmare on Elm Street. Like sequels are my favorite. My favorite Halloween is Halloween three, Halloween of four. Of course. Well, yeah. that's the best. Friday the Halloween 13th. three is empirically the best, but it's really good. It's I, really good. Yeah, I mean my favorites probably change on a day, but I'm I'm throwing out three and four as my favorites currently. Mm. Yeah, that that would be actually a good episode to do, like, not just sequels, but, like, the third installment of something. Like, specifically the third? Yes, the third installment, okay. because that's that's different than, like, you know, Terminator 2 mm-hmm. or Magic Mike XXL. If you, mm-hmm. can, if you can make the third movie land better than the yeah. first. So would it be... Like franchises as a whole, or specifically trilogies? Then I'm gonna go with franchises as okay. a whole. Okay. Yeah. Like that. Nightmare has a good one. Dream Warriors is always up there. Mm. Yeah. But a lot of times it's not the same director that started mm-hmm. it, right? Mm. No, most of the time it's not. I'm trying to think like, of a third movie by the same director. Like Steven Soderbergh, the third Magic Mike just came out. That was a Soderbergh. Yeah. Um, uh, but he didn't direct the second one. He just did the editing. Oh, I didn't and, know that. And then um, cinematography. Yeah. He did uh, all three ocean. Well, that's a trilogy. Exorcist hmm. three. Yeah. Is there fantastic. We go. And that's yeah. not the same. Yeah, that's, that's not freaking. That's Blatty. Blatty. Um, mm-hmm. Getting way off topic I'm get here. Cut but... off on this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Resident <laughs> Evils, my loves, my Resident Evil movies. The third one is not Paul W. S. Anderson, but he comes back for the fourth, fifth, and sixth. Mm. Um, Fascinating how that yeah. happens. Yeah. Well, I'll ha- yeah. I'll have to do a series on this. I was yeah. Just... No, now I'm going to start going down rabbit holes thinking about this. <laughs> the the third the third movie is the sweet spot because the second is sort of like. It it's expected in horror, mm-hmm. especially. Um, but if you can if you can keep the momentum going, I feel like that's yeah. Very... Normally, normally, like the second one has diff. If there's going to be a third, it's differentiated itself enough from the first to warrant it. Mm-hmm. Or I guess if it's just like a random horror franchise, it's just going to keep delivering on what people want. Now, what do you kills, think? Of, what kills. do you think about Scream, AJ? I am. A, gigantic scream fan like absolutely huge scream fans 
Scream One is probably my favorite horror movie right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love all of them, even the two new ones. I've loved, but I've liked the fifth one a lot. The most recent one I really did like. Um, but yeah, one to four are classics. Absolutely. Okay. Parker so it, Posey's did, it didn't go third. down. There go. Um, yeah. I mean, they're not as good as the first, and the second one is the second best. But uh, I wouldn't call any of them like bad. I I genuinely really like all of them. Or like uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Evil Dead. I guess ends at. Well, Army no, of I... the third one's my favorite Evil Dead movie. There you oh, go. Wow, Army of Darkness. Yeah, should have that kept one, the original title, Medieval Dead. Would have been I still, I still need to continue with that because I stopped at the first one because I didn't mm -hmm. like it very much, and so, I know that Evil Dead is sort of a yeah. Silly. I mean, the second one is basically running back the first one, but with like more budget, polished right. film crew and everything. Right. The third one is, I don't know, an acquired taste probably. I love it because it was the first one I saw and I grew up with it. Um, and the new ones, the reboots are fun. They feel different, but uh, they're good. Yeah. I like them. So there's there's really no segue, <laughs> AJ. Cause we, uh, yeah, off what, topic. What, well, what... What AJ ended up choosing for his hidden gems is very interesting because um, they're both Japanese movies and they're both from the same year, mm -hmm. 1996. Uh, and they're very lighthearted, sort of joyous ventures. Um, so the first one that he chose was uh, by Atami, which is Supermarket Woman, made in 1996. This one I hadn't seen i had seen tim popo and and that's all that i knew of him but it has the same spirit so aj how would you describe this film to somebody who has never seen it um so i the way i described it to my brother because i got him to watch it a year or two ago was okay. i told him it was like good burger except about a grocery store where you have a giant like mega grocery store opened nearby. They're trying to close out the small local grocery store. Right. And it's just kind of about getting your ground and finding your audience and just saving the grocery store. And it is very wholesome along the way. It's a great slice of life movie. Um, and I think the best way, there's a quote in the movie talking about the like local housewives that come and shop at this grocery store because it's yes. a grocery store for just everyday goods. They just sell food. It's just average food. There's nothing super nice about it. And the main woman says that the people that come here are creating happiness for their family. And that really just feels like everything the movie is trying to do. It's just trying to make everyday people happy. And I think it works. <laughs> Well, b basically what's happening is that there's a there's a store called Discount Demon, right? Mm -hmm. That's in direct competition with a store called The Honest Mart. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're not sure how to rival this Discount Demon store because it's giving such low prices. They bring in this lady who is just an ordinary housewife, but she has like an exceptional gift for um she can just she can just sort of see what needs to be done it's like yeah she, uh, she's good at connecting with right the like people that shop at the grocery store right and and she just has a vision for what needs to be done and how it needs to be done so she comes in and she sort of breathes new life into the into the store and people are kind of hesitant to change, but then they do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of like, uh, reminds me of like a George Bailey type of character. Yeah. And it, it has the same kind of spirit in it too. Yeah. Of like a community Where, coming together and like right. rallying around something. Right. Uh, but because it's Itami, there's this, infectious energy to it like mm -hmm. it, it 
is that the thing that resonates with you, AJ? Like the, what hits you about it is the energy or is it something else? Um, it's probably the energy. I mean, I, I adore Atami and the lead actress, Nabuko Miyamoto is, was his wife. She started, she was in all 10 of his movies and starred in eight of the 10. And the energy she's able to convey and like Atami knows her really well, obviously, and writes all the characters for her. So it's like that combination really brings out like the energy she's able to bring. Um, like her smile is in, in, it's infectious in every movie she's in and in Tampopo and in supermarket woman and a taxing woman, all of them. Like when you, when she smiles, it's like, he just knows how to like light the screen up, edit everything together to just get like, like maximum oomph out of her. Right. And yeah, like I said, it's just infectious in this movie. Yeah. She has sort of a uh, contagious enthusiasm as well mm-hmm. as like um, this process improvement <laughs> sort of logistical spirit, like where it's, it's not just that, she cares it's that she also knows how to get things done Mm -hmm. and there's sort of a visceral satisfaction with it's almost like um watching gordon ramsay or or like a makeover show yeah and that's what another thing i really like about this movie that i think every time i rewatch it i notice more and i appreciate more that they do this is there's no backstory for her or for Goro, the person who runs the supermarket, you know, from their very first meet cute, they talk, both of their spouses have passed on. So they're both mm-hmm. just single people living in the world and they're older. Right. They're both like in their fifties, late forties, fifties, give or take. And the first meet cute is when Goro is at the rival grocery store spying on them to see their prices and everything. Right. And he starts egging on the manager that's talking to the shoppers. And then she joins him or vice versa. She's egging the manager on and he joins her before realizing they know each other from high school. And they start doing a dance, which is adorable. It's so um, adorable. Yeah. And so it's just like a great first meeting between the two. You have the connection that uh, they're both widowers. They knew each other in high school. And that's it. You don't know anything about her. She seems like she has some background in working at a supermarket. And just because, like you said, she knows exactly what to do. Like she's a Gordon Ramsay type deal, except infectiously happy instead of like angry at everything. Um, But no, it just says she's a housewife. She shopped at grocery store, so she knows what they like. And that's it. And yeah, and she has this intuition about like when you go to a store, uh, what the what the deeper longing is, like what they're looking for that mm-hmm. they want to make their family happy, what the produce is supposed to be conveying, um, just the intricacies and mm-hmm. the film uh sort of has a lack of conflict, which I like. It's kind mm-hmm. of a hangout movie in that respect. Uh like the movie Chef with John Favreau, where there's just not, mm-hmm. there's a minimal amount of conflict just to keep it going. Um, but it mostly is just sort of a slice of life, you know, feel good. Yeah. Venture. And I like how it feels very, um, like talking about how the housewives are coming here to create happiness for their families. Yes. It feels like the grocery store itself is like a found family, especially towards the end when the one of the like owners oh i'm not going to go into spoilers but they there's a little conflict at the end um their emphasis on little conflict um and it's just the people that want to be there and enjoy working with each other and being around each other stay together and it's wholesome it's really good to see all of that it's good seeing it evolve over the course of the film how the relationships just keep adding together and adding together um and yeah i like it (laughs) it's very wholesome it's just it's very life affirming and uh i think tampopo is the superior film just in Mm -hmm. terms of 
uh, its variety, mm -hmm. but I do love, I, I did love Supermarket Woman. I feel yeah. like it's, if you want to be cheered up and <laughs> like you're feeling down. This yeah, is it's very, down. uh, like Tampopo has all like the side escapades and random interludes that feel very like Boonwellian <laughs> and just experimental right. out of nowhere. Um, right. But this is very much, I mean, this was his second to last film. Um, right. He died the year after while another one of his films was in the theaters. Um, but it feels like a late career, even though he had only been making like directing films since 84. So 12 years prior, but this feels like a movie, a master would make like 40 years into their career, just wanting to hang out with their friends. Um, right. Cause kind it's of a like Ozu with an autumn afternoon where it feels mm -hmm. like the end, but you know, they've still got it. Yeah. And there's a lot of, so Ozu is a big blind spot for me, but I know um, just like the connections going through like Japanese humanist directors, like you have Akira Kurosawa, Ozu, even like Koreeda are very, I mean, just like down to earth humanists. Um, mm -hmm. Atami definitely continues that humanism, but it's like the word I used earlier. It's very whimsical. It's just it's like, I, I don't want to say happier because it's not happier, but it's just very, uh, like, I think whimsical is the right nature. It's like uh, Nobuhiku Obayashi, another one of my favorites who made House. Um, a lot of his films, like, parallel Atami's in my mind, where it's kind of more fantastical. It's more um, almost ridiculous in the setups, but it just works out like you buy into it. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I will say so, Obayashi's supermarket film, Beijing Watermelon, yeah. would make a great double with Supermarket Woman. Make a double feature with Supermarket Woman. Yes. Would be yes. a very good grocery double. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you want to get your like produce on, oh, that's yeah. perfect. There you go. <laughs> yes. So that one is uh AJ's first pick, Supermarket Woman. The second one, which is uh, very similar in spirit, I felt, uh, is Shall We Dance, which is also 1996. Masayuki Suo. I think that's right. right. I don't speak Japanese. That sounds right. That's I'm how just going to say it. it. I'm going to say it with confidence, <laughs> uh, which you might feel uh, is familiar because it was a remake. That was a stupid remake with <laughs> Richard Gere, uh, which I'm not even going to mention. I just mentioned it, but let's just scratch it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this one um, is just uh, superb and uh, has an actor who's in a lot of movies. AJ had mentioned to me, reminded me that he's in The Cure or Cure. Mm -hmm. And um, what else did you say? He was in Tempo Bo. Yeah, he's the man in the, the, man white, in the white suit, suit. and the like weird sexual food interludes. Uh, yeah, he's in a lot forget. of stuff. Um, Shall We Dance yeah. has a really, like, legitimately legendary cast for a Japanese film with Yakusho there. Um, he's also in a lot of Takashi Miike films, Kiyoshi Kurosawa films. Um, I, I'm gonna, I wrote down some names for people. Um, Go for it. Naota Takanaka, who, again, don't speak Japanese. I may be butchering these names. He's in an, it feels like almost every Takashi Miike film. He's a big voice actor in Ghibli films. Um, mm. He in some Shinya Tsukamoto films. Um, some of my personal favorites for the production company Sushi Typhoon, which is very uh, CGI blood heavy, like Tokyo Gore Police stuff. Um, you have Akira Emoto, who's again, a lot of Takashi Miike, a lot of Kiyoshi Kurosawa. Obayashi films, a bunch of Godzilla movies, Koreeda films. Um, you have Kyoko Kagawa, who is in some smaller films like Tokyo Story, High and Low, um, Afterlife, Sancho the Bailiff, Mothra. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's like Reno Sugi is how I found this film. He, again, uh, tons of Takashi Miike, tons of Kiyoshi Kurosawa, 
a bunch of Takeshi Kitano films. Um, and it, it's like, there are four or five other actors in here who have careers spanning like 20, 30 years with like a hundred, 200 plus credits. Um, it's pretty remarkable, the cast in Shall We Dance. And it's just such a, uh, it's, it's basically a midlife crisis film. Uh, <laughs> I told the AJ that it reminded me of fight club, <laughs> but it's like, a, it's like a wholesome fight club because mm -hmm. it's like somebody choosing to, to deal with that sort of longing and missing somethingness and then, uh, just taking a bomb dancing class. Yeah. So it's a cool setup where. Like you have this salary man who um, he's married. He has a daughter. He goes to work. He comes home every day. Um, mm -hmm. He just bought a house, which is like not the like inciting incident for the film, but it's kind of like a shadow looming over it where he has a huge mortgage now. And I think he specifically <laughs> says like something along the lines of like, I've sold my soul to the company so I could do this because Right, that's so what I can you pay do. my mortgage. Yeah, basically. like that. You have he has his wife, he has a kid, he has a house, he has his job. Right. He's doing everything right. right. And right. then every day when he gets on the train or when he gets off the train coming home to catch another train, and he's waiting uh, for that second train to arrive. There is uh, just a building, and there's an open window on the top floor, and they have ballroom dancing there. So he catches. He doesn't catch the eye. He just watches the main teacher through that window and becomes infatuated with her and eventually goes up there and kind of gets pushed through the door into the class. But uh, he starts taking the classes and it it's pretty magical once it starts coming together. Right. Um, it's it's kind of like uh, where like later in life you discover a passion that you had and then you sort of pour yourself into it. But in this instance, it's like it's also clouded in secrecy. Mm -hmm. So there's this there's this thing of like the thrill of being invested in something and giving your heart to something that nobody knows about. Yeah, like the very, he just goes on um, Wednesday nights. The very, it's not like first said thing in the film, but there's like an opening text that says um, like ballroom dancing is under suspicion or regarded with suspicion in mm -hmm. Japanese society because it's right, very it's like looked down upon. Yeah, it's very like hands on and like you're holding someone up to your body. And in that culture, I guess it's just. That is like taboo. Yeah, you can't do that. What are you talking? You're gonna hold someone's hand in public? Mm -mm. Don't you dare. Too much. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's something that I feel like uh, makes sense in context. Mm -hmm. Like when you're watching it, you're like, oh, I could completely believe that these people are very, they're very hands off, mm -hmm. and so to do something like this is kind of radical. Obviously, in American society, that would not be at all. Mm -hmm. um, but you you do sort of feel for the characters. And then it's not just that, you know, like his wife ends up hiring a private detective <laughs> because she she's like, what the heck is he doing with his time sort of mm -hmm. thing. And he and, comes um, home with perfume on him because he's at the right, ballroom dancing. Because he's with other women. Mm -hmm. um, but it's almost like it's it's more than an affair for him because it's something that he loves. Yeah. So, it like re reignites him and like, he's yeah. actually happy for the first time in years. Right. Which is something that I feel like everyone can relate to. It's like <laughs> the malaise of, you know, you're just having a job to pay the bills mm -hmm. and to sort of get through. But if you have something in your life that, like ignites your passion or makes you feel like yourself that's more powerful than mm -hmm. anything else and then it sort of takes over so this movie is very emblematic of that feeling and i'm gonna like. go back to what you were saying how it doesn't feel like this is a very cultural kind of movie where it's, it's yes, specifically made for, sure. for japanese culture um yes there's an interview 
with this is with the Tommy back in the 80s where he actually talks about um Japanese cinema versus like global cinema and specifically American cinema and mm. I can't he I think he calls Japanese cinema low context or no Japanese cinema is high context where you need the context of the society to like craft the film and American cinema is low context where anyone could connect with it it doesn't really matter if you know American culture because American culture is Hollywood and Hollywood's exported everywhere. Um, right. And I think that's really fitting um, with this film, just because you need to know like the life of a salary man in Japan. You need to know how they frame um, like public displays of affection, even if it's just ballroom dancing, it's not really even affection. Um and it's it's really interesting because I know Tommy says his films aren't necessarily this high context kind of cinema. He thinks his films are somewhere in the middle, but Suo's films are very you need the context of Japanese culture to get a grasp for shall we dance. And I know both of his other films are very much like one's about sumo wrestling and one is about a punk rocker joining a Buddhist temple. Like th- those are intrinsically Japanese things. Those have nothing to do with American culture. And you can sort of get a sense with the way that the dialogue is and the way the characters mm-hmm. build and uh, sort of the, I I almost feel like, especially with one of the characters, like who's balding and with his hair and everything, like there's this sense of like owning who you are mm-hmm. and uh, allowing yourself to be who you are so that you can actually experience that sort of zone yes in the zoneness so that yeah that guy works at the same office building as koji akusha's character um and he he's one of the like almost legends like he is in so many films uh and yeah at the office he's just this weird guy he walks funny but that you find out later he walks funny because he's like doing dance exercises. Doing while he dance walks. exercises. Yeah, and his posture yeah, is so very good. rigid, very like turning his entire body right. at once, sliding right. down like aisles. And right. then you see him at the dance studio and he has like this Fabio esque wig on and he's just an entirely different person. And right. it's really enjoyable watching. There's a really like vindicating scene later on at the office where it's not even he gets to stand up for himself um it just it comes together really well yeah it's a it's 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 a moment of saying like if you if you don't know what you're talking Mm -hmm. about don't talk about it yeah and like he knows who he is and you guys are just you guys are office workers making fun of people like who are you to right judge him for that right and you don't know what you're talking mm-hmm. about also right yeah. um yeah sh- yeah shall we dance is very uh it's it's kind of in the same way that supermarket woman is kind of minimal on the conflict this is a very sort of innocent film but it's tapping into something that's universal like there mm-hmm. was a part where um the lead character said something and i just started crying and i and i thought like oh this is this is tapping into something that's very real and it it isn't constructed to culture Mm -hmm. it just is yeah it's a very universal message and everything um right i know before this i said i read someone called it simple-minded escapism and yes we were saying it's that's pretty diminutive of it but uh it's it's like a universal escapism is better um, because every sure the like specific plot points and why things line up the way they are may be specific to Japanese culture, but mm-hmm. the ideas and the message and the like feelings of it are very universal. Like anyone can relate to finding something you really love and letting that, I guess, kind of shape who you are. And I told AJ, it makes you want to have like a secret hobby. Mm-hmm. Like it, it makes you want to do something that nobody knows about that just like fills you thing. with energy. Yeah. yeah just go and find and then become something that you're like, you're very passionate about because 
I feel like uh, a lot of people in life don't know what they love until much later. Like it's it's not it's not necessarily apparent unless you're like a kid who's like, I want to be a doctor or I want to be a lawyer or I want to do this. For a lot of us, it's a journey, not just mm -hmm. uh, an immediate, you know, you know exactly what you want to do. Yeah, and this is like a a middle-aged man who has a wife, has a teenage daughter. He's done everything he's supposed to do. He's got his house. He's got a good job. And just now he's finding out what he wants to do and how. Exactly. He can, even like as the film goes on towards the end, like include people he already loves into that, which is really affirming. <laughs> it's really good to see that. I agree. And it sort of ends on a wholesome note to borrow your word, AJ. Very wholesome. And I will go yes. back on, just because I mentioned Ozu with the Tommy, I'm going to do it again. Um, so Masayuki Suo, the director, um, mm -hmm. comes from a weird, like, the Japanese uh, genre pink films, which are, like, almost softcore. Uh, yeah, it's softcore oh. porn films, basically. His debut was a softcore porn parody, well, parody, parody of an Ozu film um, or just Ozu's like style. And he styled it exactly like Ozu, where it's like the camera's at the level of all the characters, yeah. long static And they're shots. looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, it's weird because he made a couple of those. And you can see even in a genre where you wouldn't ever think Ozu is going to be an inspiration for um he's still doing that and then he came he made three fiction three uh just like great films and then he went back to the weird exploitation pink film scene and he's made a couple films since but nothing that has i guess like got any ground and i mm -hmm. don't even know if he's still making films which is crazy because the Shall We Dance got over a dozen of like Japan's equivalent of the Oscar. Like it, like it conquered 1996 for Japanese film. And then he just kind of stopped. So I don't know if something happened in his mm. life that made him stop, but uh, it's weird. It's weird that he just kind of faded out. Yeah. Maybe he sort of made his magnum opus and then disappeared. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it, it's weird because he's still making. Like he he's made a couple films, but I don't know if I can get a hold of them over here. And also, they don't seem to have the best reviews. They definitely seem lesser than what he was making in the nineties. But mm. uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I I need to actually look into what happened to him. But uh, it's strange. Mm. Shall we dance? Is kind of the the shining light. Yeah, it's like, like the, the pinnacle. The pinnacle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Each each of these episodes, I end up doing a hidden gem from the book I'm reading for them. And this time, which is different than the other times, I actually told AJ, hey, the hidden gem for this one is F for Fake by Orson Welles, 1973. And he actually hadn't seen it, but it had been mm -hmm. on his watch list for ages. So we both watched that this week. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of excited to the fact that like we both recently got yeah. off this and and loved it like yeah. blown away. It's, by it's, it. Yeah, it's a very so this is Orson Welles last film. It's a sort of I don't know what you call like it, an, like a pseudo documentary. Yeah, pseudo documentary essay film like. Yeah, like like he like Orson Welles is trying know. He's trying to get at what makes it's like a it's like a sleight of hand sort of masterful trickery where mm. he is making a documentary about an expert forger in the world of art, but then he's also talking about a biographer who lied about a memoir they wrote for Howard Hughes and then uh Orson Welles sort of tells us to trust him in the first hour, like everything you're going to see is true, but then sort of pulls the rug 
up from under us too. So um, this is a very fascinating film that I, that really took me off guard. Yes, I I don't know. I need to go find just like essays and essays to read about it. I know right after mm-hmm. I know I saw uh, Jonathan Rosenbaum had a really good write up because he was he's fantastic. Yeah, he's yeah. one of my favorites. Um, me too. He, yeah. He was in Paris while they were making it in the 70s and got to mm. see like an early screening of it. Um, he talked to Orson Welles about it. And he, I know he specifically asked like after, no, it was before he saw it when he just had Orson tell him it was like a biographer about a forger and then some other things. Um, right. He asked like, so it's going to be like a documentary. And Orson said something along the lines of like, it's going to be like no movie you've seen before. And that is really true because it is like, it's just its own thing. It's F for fake. There's, <laughs> there's, it's hard to like nail it down. Well, I feel like a lot of documentaries now have copied its style because the way that the editing is and um, the way that it sort of references itself is very common now. Mm-hmm. But like at the time you feel you feel like watching it, it's very seminal and fresh and like you've never seen anything like it before, even though a lot of people have imitated it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's sort of cadence. I mean, if there's one thing like Orson is good at, it's being the first to do something really. I mean, like Citizen Kane is Citizen Kane. Like the editing in Magnificent Ambersons is revolutionary. And then F for right. Fake is, I mean, like you just said, it's like planting the groundwork for, I don't want to, I'm not a huge documentary watcher, so I can't say exactly how, I mean, like influential it is, but it seems like it just turns over every stone and just shows people what you can do. Yes. I think uh, the thing that I noticed about it the most was uh, Errol Morris. Mm -hmm. It brought me back to, I've seen a bunch of his movies, Mm -hmm. which are all excellent, but it reminded me most of tabloid just in the way that it sort of unfolds. And then you begin with one impression and then you sort of end with another Mm -hmm. and uh, it messes with your ideas of perception. And then also what is art uh you know what who determines what's noteworthy and what mm-hmm. isn't is also an important question uh you know uh do we leave it to the experts to tell us what's good or are we able to decide ourselves yeah it's man i don't i don't even know it it just goes so deep in all of these and gives you so much food for thought about it and that's one thing that's great about it is it doesn't it's not giving you an answer. It's not telling you like, this is what happened. This is what you should think about it. It's very much just like positing these ideas and showing right. you how it, how things can be shown and explained and talked about and be completely false. And does that like, does that matter? <laughs> like, what, like, does it matter? You get to see all of these things and make your own decision about it and it doesn't feel like you're necessarily being guided to a correct decision but you are being guided to a point where like your eyes can be open to it like he's bringing you to a point and showing you i more the possibilities than the answers and right it's really nice it's refreshing right yeah and it seems like it's also uh incredibly personal and autobiographical because he's also coming from a place of his own experience with critics Mm -hmm. and his own experience with being sort of scrutinized and handled in a way where he didn't have the freedom to just create what he wanted. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not as though someone's making this just out of nowhere. It's Orson Welles and the gravitas of his, timber and his presence and his sort of Shakespearean background influences the entire film. Yeah. And even going back to Citizen Kane where like Joseph Cotton pops up and after fake for a second says he was supposed to like, initially he was going to play Kane. Like that was going to be him. He was going to be the one who played the like 
William Randolph Hearst stand in. And right. he was saying like, as it was coming along, it became more and more obvious that Orson was the one that had to do this. And so like, those are two really good like bookmarks, like his first film and his last film finished while he was alive is um, kind of working in this field of like, I am the one doing this. I am the one presenting these like, almost illusions <laughs> like there there's half truths in them there's fakes in them but like what parts about this matter um and it's really cool to see he's the one presenting it solely like he has complete control over both of these films there's no studio interference no right. one is no producer is making him do this he is the one choosing to do this right so there's a sense of ownership there where it's like mm -hmm. this person is doing exactly what they want yeah. Like you're seeing the product of someone who has clarity of vision and was able to execute it without interference. Yeah. And it turns out really good. I know. AJ gave it five stars. I gave it four and a half. It's very powerful. Uh, so this is like a, this is a hidden gem episode that is a three-parter. It's like see supermarket woman. Great. See shall we dance. Great. CF for fake. Great. Three great movies. We are completely on board <laughs> for all three. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so with that, AJ, it was a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. It's it's a pleasure to have you on after all this time of seeing your insane logs for so many movies and being like, AJ, here's coming. here's yet another one. <laughs> uh, so many. So make sure everybody follow him just to see what he's up to next. Uh, <laughs> I, we, we're finding that out. So. Yes. <laughs> mm. And we'll see you at the movies. <laughs>